Hello everyone, I hope you're having a great week. I was until I found this case and this case made me very mad and very upset. Researching this case got me heated. I have never seen a case with so much victim blaming in it before, let alone the victim blaming of a child, a literal child. And I am saying it right off the bat, I will not have victim blaming in this comment section here today. Because let me be clear, today's case is a case of a 50 year old man grooming a 15 year old girl. And it's sick and disgusting that anyone would say that she was along for the ride. There were literal adult locals interviewed by TV stations where these adults were saying that this 15 year old girl was tangled up in it as if she was an equal participant. I think they took advantage of each other in a way, a weird way. We've heard a lot of people say, well, she went willingly. She probably did. Mm -hmm. She got pulled in just as well as she got pulled in. Now, not everyone thought that this situation was okay. Thankfully, there were townspeople saying that he should be, you know, dragged in the streets and beaten. But I think that despite some of these people in these small towns having a very old school mentality that is absolutely disgusting, I think the media was also to blame for people's views on this case. Because just seeing minor clips from this case, just doing my brief, you know, initial rundown trying to figure out this case, it seemed like most of the media was reporting this as if she was partially the blame. But once you do a little digging into this case and take some time to research and to actually look into, you know, the full documentary style interviews that happen after the fact, you will realize that this case is a lot deeper and a lot darker than was ever portrayed initially. So today I'm going to be telling you the true story of the abduction of Elizabeth Thomas by her high school teacher. This case takes place in the small rural town of Cullioca, Tennessee, which is an hour south of Nashville with a population of around 5,000 people. So it's a very small farming town. Elizabeth Thomas was a 15 year old girl living in this small town who had been homeschooled her entire life. She had four other siblings and a father worked more than he was ever at home and he worked as an exterminator. She was uh, somewhat of a tomboy, played really rough. She could switch to being really nice and sweet. Paige Griffith told us at the time of Elizabeth's disappearance that she had been a kind of surrogate mom and her daughter Erin was Elizabeth's close friend. She'd come to my house and we would talk and watch TV and eat junk food and we just hung out together. <laughs> That's Elizabeth on the left play fighting with Aaron in the back of a car. Yeah, you were. No, I wasn't. Yeah, you were. Wasn't his name just No. Her sister Sarah gave me a tour of Elizabeth's bedroom. My sister likes fish. During the day she went missing, it told its own story of an adolescent caught between two ages. Oh, that's her Xbox? Yeah, On the does. one hand, the teen who bought herself an Xbox she with money from her after school job. She just stayed up playing games. On the other, a child. She made this baby. Still yeah. enchanted by princesses and ponies. I really think that that clip of Elizabeth's bedroom really shows that 15 isn't an adult. At 15 years old, you're still trying to figure out who you are. You're still in between being innocent and trying to learn to mature. On top of that, according to Elizabeth herself, their home life was not good. There was abuse happening, violence in the home, which makes a lot more sense why Elizabeth would want to spend more time at her friend's house than in her own home. And this abuse went so far that Elizabeth and her siblings ended up reporting their own mother to CPS. Their mother, Kimberly Thomas, would end up being charged with multiple counts of child abuse and neglect. And their father was hardly ever home, and he claims that he didn't realize the extent that things had gotten to in his home between his children and his wife. So Kimberly would be removed from the home, but this meant that the children couldn't be homeschooled anymore because their father had to work. And this is when Elizabeth would be enrolled in Kalioka Unit School. Now just think about this. Elizabeth had never been in a school environment before. Teenagers can be mean, and all of these children grew up together in this small town, so I'm sure they all went to school together growing up, and so they all had these friend groups that had been established since they were little kids. And then Elizabeth shows up and she's the new girl. She said in her interview with ABC News that boys would call her ugly and that she didn't feel like she fit in there. And that's completely understandable. But one person did notice this little girl's vulnerability. Her 50-year-old health teacher, Tad Cummins. Now, I remember back when I said in the beginning of this video that Elizabeth was being partially blamed in the media and in the public for what happened to her. Just remember that this 15-year-old girl had been sheltered her entire life She'd been abused and now she was an outcast at school. She was the perfect victim for a predator. And I say this because there are documented interviews with actual convicted predators where they describe what their perfect victim was. And I'll play that for you right now. How did you get them alone? Grooming. Um, I would check out their family situation, 
I would check out their clothing to see how well they were, you know, financially. I would check out their social interaction with other kids, you know. When we were on the ballparks or on the, on the gym floor, you know, I would make sure which ones I wanted to molest. I would give them special attention, congratulate them, talk to them when I know that I would never be allowed to talk to anybody else, you know, aside from everybody. I would give them the attention that a, an official is not supposed to give anybody. And it made them feel like, wow, he's paying me attention. You know, it, it is a direct form of grooming. Were there certain characteristics that you looked for in children before molesting them? In children, yes, but more I also looked at their families. If I thought the father was a threat, I would not approach the child. If I thought that the child had friends that he would tell, I would not approach him. If I thought the child had friends that were in the same capacity he was, I would approach him for the simple fact that if I could molest him, I could lure him into believing, grooming him into believing that he would enjoy it. So perhaps a, a, a child that doesn't really have a whole lot of friends, maybe not really a strong family, things like that. Yes, no spiritual values, um, weak in education, you know, needs help in many ways, um, even from uh, split parenting, you know, has a mother who may be having problems with the family, you know, well, here comes superhero in to help out, you know, wow, well, thank you very much. No problem, you ever need me to take him away for the night so you can have a night out? No problem. Tad Cummins is a predator, and he recognized that Elizabeth would be the perfect victim and he took advantage of that. Plain and simple. I don't see the argument there. On top of that, he was her health teacher. A class where you're supposed to learn about puberty and bodily anatomy, mental health. And this monster exploited all of that. Yet besides people being interviewed, victim blaming a child, I've also seen news reporters grossly wording their reports on this case as if she was an equal participant. And as I go through this case, I want you to remember that there were adults and there probably still are adults who blame this child for what happened. And it's disgusting. I don't see reporters talking about Elizabeth's past and the vulnerable state she was in other than the ABC News interview she did after the fact where she got to tell her own story but she was a child and this man was a perverted pedophile. Now let's get a little bit into who Tad Cummins is. Tad Cummins actually went to school with the DA of Maury County. When the DA was interviewed, he described Tad as a funny guy, a cut up, an outgoing guy growing up. Tad and his wife, Jill, were high school sweethearts where they married in 1985 and had been together for over 30 years at this time when all this took place. Tad had even done missionary work in Panama, taught Sunday school and sung in the church choir. This predator had created the allure of a normal average guy next door. A holy man, a grandfather who taught children. His own daughters describing him as an all-American dad, and they loved him and they relied on him. Tad Cummins was the cool teacher everybody loved. He had the allure of the guy who would never expect to do something like this. And there Tad is, showering 15-year-old Elizabeth Thomas with all the attention she had never gotten. He made me feel like I didn't have anyone else and no one really cared about me like he did. Buying her a Bible. He even started taking her to church with his wife. Now, according to Jill Cummins, the entire reason that they started bringing Elizabeth to church with them was because their pastor was going to start talking about abuse and overcoming traumatic events, and they thought bringing her would help her out. According to Jill, her husband had a father-daughter relationship with Elizabeth. Jill herself started calling Elizabeth her third daughter, and all of that seems pretty innocent until you look a little deeper into Tad's life. And when you look a little deeper into Tad's life, he doesn't start to seem like the perfect family man. At one point, he was working as a respiratory therapist at a hospital, and according to one of his coworkers, Tad had a problem with authority and didn't like being told no. According to this coworker, Tad took a pay cut and became a teacher because he could be in control of the children because children don't say no to a teacher. He'd have all the control he'd always wanted. And then you have Elizabeth Thomas walking into his class, who he could fully control. A girl who's been abused by adults her entire life, and now she finally finds an adult that she thinks she can trust, which makes this just all even more awful. At one point, Elizabeth had even tried to go to Tad to talk to him about her getting on antidepressants and seeing a therapist, but Tad ended up telling her not to do any of that and to just go to him instead. Even when she attempted to get help for herself, he deterred her. 
and led her right back to him. On top of all of that, Tad was telling Elizabeth lies about himself. He was saying he was a millionaire and had worked for the CIA where he had, you know, saved people and killed the bad guys. Out of school, Elizabeth and Tad were speaking over Instagram where he'd post romantic quotes on his feed, such as love at first sight. On Elizabeth's Instagram, she would post photo quotes reading, I look forward to going to school just to see you. And I love you so, 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 so much. I think these posts really fueled the whole victim blaming aspect in this case and this whole old school mentality of of women are sirens that lure men in and men just can't stay away from them even though they're children. It's disgusting that it's still happening because this case is only like five years old. It's still happening in this world. But it wasn't just Tad posting Instagram photos of lovey-dovey quotes. Tad was actually actively trying to sext Elizabeth through the Instagram DMs. But things weren't just online. Elizabeth would start to be alone in Tad's classroom with him more and more frequently. And the sexting ended up turning into real life. Tad would eventually end up kissing Elizabeth at school. And she didn't end up telling anyone because she was afraid that by telling her friends, they would make fun of her for kissing an old man. She was scared that she would get in trouble. And you will see after that he also made a lot of threats towards her to get her to not talk as well, which is very commonly seen in cases like this. But the kissing would turn into more. Tad would end up beginning to S.A. Elizabeth inside of his classroom closet. Elizabeth would describe the abuse as he would open up the closet and look at me a certain way. And she knew that if she didn't go inside of that closet, that he was going to be upset. And she was afraid to see him angry because like his former coworker said, Tad did not like the word no. Eventually, Tad would be caught abusing Elizabeth. January 23rd of 2017, a female student became witness to Tad kissing Elizabeth inside of his classroom. And this female student was disgusted. She was immediately disturbed. And so she ran and told school officials. According to her written statement, it wasn't like a makeout kiss, just a peck on the lips. So the school ended up starting to investigate this report, but Elizabeth was scared and she would end up denying anything happened. According to the story Elizabeth told at the time to the school officials, she had an argument with another teacher and she had went to Tad and he had consoled her, but he didn't kiss her. Because of course, as pedophiles and abusers like to do, they tell their victim that they can't tell anyone, that they're not gonna be believed, that everyone at school was going to know that she liked to kiss old men and that Tad would be fired if she told. And she wouldn't want him to get fired, right? But here's the thing that really shocks me in this case. So a student, tells school officials that she sees a teacher kissing a 15 year old student. That is on January 23rd. It wouldn't be until a week later that authorities would be contacted. Authorities who should be the ones investigating this case for the last week, but the school officials thought they'd take it upon themselves. And Elizabeth's father wouldn't find out until January 31st when investigators came to him asking to question him about the situation. January 31st. Elizabeth's father was never notified by the school district. And then Tad wasn't interviewed until February 1st. And of course he told detectives that he was like a father figure at the school and that he had never kissed Elizabeth. He would never do something like that. So again, even though this 50 year old teacher was caught kissing a student, nothing happened for over a week. During that week before authorities were contacted, Elizabeth was even allowed by the school to go on a school field trip where Tad was the only chaperone, the only adult on this field trip. And this happened on January 27th. Still a few days before the police were contacted. This vulnerable child who was being abused by this teacher was allowed to go on this field trip with this teacher. And guess what happened during this field trip? Tad propositioned Elizabeth to have sex with him, but she ended up refusing. And then on top of that, when police were finally notified, she was simply just removed from his class. Tad wasn't even suspended. It wouldn't be until two days later on February 3rd when a teacher would contact authorities suspecting that she had seen Elizabeth with Tad in his classroom again. When police reviewed the surveillance footage, they confirmed that Tad and Elizabeth had indeed been in his classroom together for over 30 minutes. As a result of this, Tad was finally suspended by the school on February 6th. Keep in mind, he was caught kissing her on January 23rd. So Tad's now suspended. Meanwhile, everyone at the school, teachers and kids included, are finding out what was happening. And now Elizabeth is starting to be teased and bullied for it. Even teachers, grown ass adults, were saying shit to a 15 year old abuse victim. There were people telling her that she had ruined his life. Everything he had groomed her saying was going to happen if she told 
happened, which is absolutely horrible. And I hope that all of those children, now that they're adults, and all of those teachers who were adults at the time feel really fucking bad. They should be ashamed to show their faces in public. And this girl deserves a million apologies, especially once I get through this whole case and you hear everything else that ends up happening to her. No one around this little girl was supporting her. Everyone was telling her that she was the problem. She was the reason everything was happening to her. When all she needed was someone to tell her that she was going to be okay and that everything that happened to her wasn't her fault. It just disgusts me that not only the children, but the adults in her life were treating her this way. And that's why this case makes me so angry. So Tad's at home now, and you'd wonder what his wife's thinking about all of this. But of course, Tad ended up telling his wife, Jill, that he hadn't done anything. Everything was a big mistake. But now that he didn't have the children at school to control, his secret need for control started seeping into his home life. According to Jill, after his suspension, her husband started acting very strange. She used this example that he'd always make this coffee before bed, and now all of a sudden he had started to tell her how to make the coffee, even though they've been together for 30 years, like she knows how to make his coffee. So little things like that he started to like nitpick at. And according to her, she thought she was just scared that he was going to go to jail, which he should have been put in jail by then. He should have been. Now, despite suspending Tad to separate him from Elizabeth, Tad was still secretly contacting Elizabeth. And he was contacting her from February 6th, which is when he was suspended, all the way until March 12th, which was the day before the kidnapping. According to Elizabeth, Tad had forced her to continue to contact him through Instagram, saying, I had to keep in communication with him while he was suspended. And any time I wouldn't post for a few hours, he would go crazy and say that I was cheating on him and saying if he found out that I had another boy, he'd kill him. Tad was convincing Elizabeth that the only way to get away from all of the pain that this little town was causing her and causing them, and the only way for them to be happy was for them to run away. He was telling her that if he couldn't have her, he was going to unalive himself. He even threatened her family. Elizabeth was quoted saying, so he started calling my phone. Sometimes he'd be threatening to unalive himself or ending someone else's life if I didn't go. Anytime he'd threaten himself, he'd threaten my family. And she was terrified of him saying, he threatened to shoot himself, to use guns. He had two of them. So even though Tad was suspended, you'd think that she would feel some relief that, you know, now he's not at school, she can go to school. No, because at school now she's being blamed for everything happening. And then when she goes home, he's still messaging her, still contacting her, threatening her and forcing her to talk to him. Elizabeth literally couldn't escape. So finally, after all of these threats, she agreed to leave town with him. She feared that something would happen to her or her family if she didn't. On the days before the kidnapping, Tad was caught on security footage shopping for women's hair dye, which, what do you think that's for? It would be on March 13th of 2017 that 15 year old Elizabeth would end up waking up her sister early in the morning. And she would tell her sister that she was going to go spend the day with her friend, but then she cryptically told her that if she didn't get home by 6 p.m. to call the police. Inside, Elizabeth knew that once she got inside of Tad's car that he was not going to let her get out. The last person to see Elizabeth was a friend of hers who ended up dropping her off at a restaurant called Shawnee's in Columbia, Tennessee around 7.30 to 8 a.m. Little did this friend know that their high school teacher, 50-year-old Tad Cummins, was filling up his car with gas at a gas station nearby around 8.30 a.m. Surveillance would show Elizabeth wearing an oversized flannel and carrying an overnight bag in her arms. When Elizabeth realized that Tad was running a little bit late, she ended up leaving her bag on the ground because there was actually a note inside that she hoped would tip off authorities. This note was something that Tad had forced her to write saying that she was going to New York so that police would be looking in the wrong direction because they were actually going to be going west. But according to Elizabeth, she tried to make the note sound very unbelievable so that when police would read it, they would realize that they were, she was lying in the note. Later that day, the pair would be reported in Decatur, Alabama, located by Elizabeth's cell phone ping. But at some point, Tad ended up making Elizabeth throw her cell phone along with his cell phone over a bridge so that they couldn't be tracked. And then he also ended up disconnecting the GPS in his car. Later that day, Elizabeth wouldn't return home by 6 p.m. And her sister started to get really scared. Eventually, her father ended up finding out. I'm assuming the sister told her father about what happened that morning, and he would end up reporting Elizabeth missing. In the following days, her father would end up doing interviews, pleading for his daughter's safe return. Meanwhile, at the home of Tad Cummins, his wife Jill would end up finding a note that her husband had wrote saying that he was leaving to clear his head and to not call the police. Well, it turns out Tad clearly was not clearing his head. He had taken his wife's car, a loan for over $4,000, two guns, and he had kidnapped a 15-year-old girl. It wasn't until the news broke of Elizabeth's kidnapping on March 14th that Tad would finally, officially, be fired from Cullioke Unit School. 
It took all that time. Apparently kissing children is okay, but kidnapping them, that's too far for the school. On the 15th, two days after Elizabeth is kidnapped, an Amber Alert will be put out by the TBI. Tad and Elizabeth evaded police for several weeks over multiple states. And this would end up landing Tad on Tennessee's top 10 most wanted list. Jill would also go on national television pleading for her husband to turn himself in, saying that she was shocked and had no clue that any of this was going on. Please do the right thing and turn yourself into the police and bring Beth home. It would take until two weeks until the investigation when police would learn that two days after they had disappeared, so on March 15th, Elizabeth and Tad had stayed at a Motel 8 in Oklahoma City. They had also gone shopping at a local Walmart where Tad Cummins bought chocolate, cheese, lube, and other items. Police would also discover that before they had disappeared, Tad was Googling search terms such as teenage marriage online. He was also looking into how common his car was and if it would stick out. Police would also discover that Elizabeth had changed her Instagram bio to write wife ring emoji. She had also commented hashtag mission complete on one of Tad's posts. I think this also kind of led to the speculation that the two had willingly ran away together, which again, let me reiterate. This is a 50-year-old man grooming a child. Meanwhile, Elizabeth recounted her time during her first few weeks with Tad on the run. And if you think she was a willing participant, maybe this will help change your mind. Elizabeth wasn't allowed to leave the car without Tad. And if Tad ever ended up leaving Elizabeth in the car by herself, he would lock all the doors and he would turn on the alarm system so that if she opened the door, the alarms would go off. Elizabeth was also forced to sleep naked and Tad would hide her clothing so that when he did fall asleep, she wouldn't run away. And every night, Tad Cummins, this 50 year old high school teacher would SA this 15 year old girl. And when she tried to go and take a shower to try to wash off how disgusted she felt from being essayed, he wouldn't let her shower by herself. Tad wouldn't even let her get up in the middle of the night to use the washroom. He had to watch her. She said that he said hurtful things to her, such as, he told me he likes skinny girls and I ate what he told me to eat because if I didn't, I wouldn't get anything at all. And I was hungry. Tad and Elizabeth would end up traveling from Oklahoma to Colorado to Utah. And this is where Tad started to buy alcohol for Elizabeth to drink. Because according to Tad at this point, Elizabeth was quote unquote having problems. AKA Elizabeth was traumatized from Tad grooming her, kidnapping her, continuing to SA her, verbally abuse her and terrorize her. But Tad was getting irritated having to deal with her. So he decided to start getting her drunk so that he could numb her and continue to abuse her. You know what that reminds me a lot of? The stories of human trafficking victims that are drugged so that they can continue to be used. Now think about everything I just described. And there's probably so much more that we can't even imagine that she went through. And then remember that there are adults blaming this little girl. Just remember that. Now, despite everything that Elizabeth was going through, she was really smart. And she actually started collecting rocks from every county that she was in and writing the counties on them because she was hoping that if she did get found, that they could try to prosecute him for every state that she had taken her to. Elizabeth also remembers one night seeing a news story about her on a TV in a hotel that they were staying in. And this is when Tad finally started to panic and he decided that he wanted to take Elizabeth to Panama since he had done missionary work there and he knew the area really well. And he knew that like they wouldn't really be found out there. And this is when Tad comes up with one of the stupidest plans I've ever seen a criminal come up with. He decides that they're going to attempt to kayak from California to Panama. Now, let me just throw a little visual on the screen here for you. From California to Panama is 3,000 nautical miles. Now, I've been in the ocean of Florida on a jet ski, and those waters can get rough, let alone on a kayak going 3,000 miles in the ocean. You'd think that he'd think this plan through and think it's not a smart idea. Like, it's not even feasibly possible. But no, Tad forced Elizabeth to get into a kayak and they started trying to paddle to Panama. Now, they didn't get very far because the waves got so bad, they almost died. And this is when he realized, you know, maybe we should turn around. Thankfully, he realized that this was a really stupid plan. Unfortunately, it was after they got in a kayak and started paddling through the ocean. But now that his insane kayak plan failed, he decided that they needed to go somewhere very, very remote because he wanted Elizabeth all to himself and no one else could have her. So he decided they were going to go to a very, very remote commune. And what is more isolating than going to a commune in the middle of the woods where no one really goes and watches television. They're all very self-sustained. They don't really contact the outside world. So they wouldn't really know that this little girl had been kidnapped. It would be the perfect place to take a kidnapped child. 
This is when the two would end up in Cecilville, California, which is a small town in Northern California near the Oregon border. But they ended up getting lost trying to find the commune and they ran into a man named Griffin Berry. Now, Griffin Berry ended up feeling bad for them. He gave them some directions and some money. And this is when the pair ended up at Black Bear Ranch. Is located so far off the grid, it feels like another world. We're an off the grid um, homesteading community. We don't have any television, radio, cell phone, internet. There's no newspaper delivery or other contact with the outside world besides what comes in and out of the driveway. The reclusive residents are reluctant to let us use our cameras, only allowing us to shoot this video on their older model iPhone. So those are chickens up there? Or? Yeah, chickens and ducks. Our guide, who goes by the name April Showers, gives us a tour. And here shows up a man and a young girl who claim to be 44-year-old John and 24-year-old Joanna. And the commune did welcome them in. They gave them a bed, they shared their food, but Elizabeth had nowhere to go now. She was officially brought into the middle of nowhere and isolated. They would stay there for about a week and a half, but things went south pretty quickly. And this was majorly due to Ted's temper and his just bad vibes, bad energy he brought to the commune because these commune places are usually very, you know, happy energy, kind of hippie energy, like living one with nature, stuff like that. And Tad, that's not Tad. He wants to control things. It's his way or the highway. And they're just not going to put up with that in a commune like that. And clearly they did not. Tad ended up starting an argument with a member named April, who seemed to be kind of one of the head members. And this was after he defined the commune's work rules, because normally you live in these communes for free, but you still need to do labor and other things to stay there. You know, everyone's helping each other out and building the community. Up. He also apparently would just want to like lay in bed all day, probably with Elizabeth and abuse her. Apparently this argument between Tad and April escalated to Tad pulling out a knife. He ended up dropping the knife on the ground, but there was a lot of yelling and screaming. And Elizabeth was actually so scared at this point thinking that he was actually going to kill someone. But thankfully Tad didn't kill anyone, but this meant that the two of them were actually kicked out of this commune with nothing to their name, but $10, some eggs and two oranges. Elizabeth said that they were even eating flowers at one point. So 36 days after leaving Tennessee, Tad ended up getting desperate after being kicked out of this commune. He went back into that nearby town of Cecilville. And the two would actually run into that Good Samaritan that had helped them out a week and a half earlier to get to the commune. Tad told Griffin Berry this whole sob story about how they had a house fire, he had lost his job, and how they were trying to better themselves and, you know, get back on their feet. You know, Griffin Berry felt bad for them, so he ended up offering them to stay in a small cabin that he had. Now, this cabin was more of a shack. It wasn't insulated. It just had a roof and four walls and a plywood floor. There wasn't anything in it. There wasn't even like a wood stove or anything to keep them warm. Griffin Berry also gave them a job opportunity to make some money where they could collect rocks in the nearby river for a masonry project that he was having. Griffin also said that he gave them some food and he said that when he did give them the food, it made Elizabeth really excited. But that Elizabeth really didn't talk to him much. Even when he tried to talk to her, she was just very quiet and didn't say things. And he also found her accent strange. So this is when he started to question things. Griffin would end up confiding in one of his neighbors about the strange couple that he had living in one of his cabins. When I was trying to strike up a conversation, I picked them up in the morning. I was like, what's your name? And she was like, Joanna. It was almost with like an accent. Something seems off. I was like, that girl won't talk you know, to me really or anything. That night, the neighbor makes a startling discovery, finding this Amber Alert and warns Griffin that one of his new friends may actually be a wanted fugitive. And when Griffin ended up seeing the photo of both Tad and Elizabeth, he knew immediately that that is who he had living in his cabin and they ended up calling the police. Overnight, a SWAT team would arrive hiding out in the woods surrounding the cabin, waiting for Tad to come out. Since they had knowledge that Tad was armed with two guns, they didn't want a hostage situation happening. So they wanted Tad to come out first. So they ended up devising a plan to have Griffin go and knock on the door of the cabin to wake them up to go do their work at the river. Thankfully, that plan worked out safely. But before Tad was arrested, he still had one more thing left to say to Elizabeth. And according to Elizabeth, Tad whispered to her before he was arrested saying, he said not to tell them that we had done anything, that he had forced me to go. He said to say that I went willingly, say that he was trying to protect me. He told me to go along with it. Finally, Tad Cummins would be arrested and immediately charged with transporting a minor over state lines for the purpose of engaging in criminal sexual conduct and obstruction of justice. And less than 24 hours later, Elizabeth would be reunited with her family. And it was heartbreaking hearing her father say that he wasn't sure how she was going to react to coming home because he believes that Tad told her that if she went home, her father would be mad at her. But her father was the farthest from being mad. He was just relieved and happy to see that his daughter was alive. Later, Elizabeth tearfully reunites with her family. I actually 
got out of the vehicle and I ran to where she was. It was just amazing to finally get to see her. It was really great to have her tell me that she loved me. From what I read though, Elizabeth wasn't really allowed to see many people at first. Um, they wanted to keep it very limited. She was immediately entered in in-person counseling and therapy for everything that she had went through, which is completely understandable because she had been through so much in her short life. And in present time, Elizabeth's actually doing interviews explaining her story. And, and these are the interviews that I mentioned at the beginning where it seems that before she started speaking about her own version of events. People had all of these assumptions about what happened. And now she's finally coming out, explaining her story, explaining what happened to her. And it's, I think it's really powerful hearing the words come from her mouth. Meanwhile, Taz's wife, Jill, divorced him, which good for you, Jill. Good for you. If you really had nothing to do with us, you you need nothing to do with that man. In 2008, Tad Cummins would finally plead guilty and was sentenced to 20 years in prison, and he has to register as a sex offender for the rest of his life, which, good. He should have been a long time before that. At his sentencing, a prosecutor read Elizabeth's victim impact statement, which said, what you did to me was unspeakable. You saw a broken girl who was lonely and scared and traumatized. You made her feel safe and loved because you saw what she needed and made her believe that you would be her protector. All you were was a man who wanted sex and you used me and you manipulated me. Tad Cummins is a sick, disgusting criminal. That is well fucking said. Elizabeth also said that Tad Cummins told her that the devil made him pursue the inappropriate relationship with her. And I loved her response to that. She said, but if that's true, you are the devil. Your choices were yours and yours alone. A 17 year old girl should not have to tell a 52 year old man this, but choices have consequences. Your choices have destroyed not only my family, but also yours. Elizabeth is such a well-spoken young woman. And I am just so proud that she has seemed to have overcome everything that has happened to her. At, at least to some extent, but it seems that she has started to grow up and realize that what happened to her was not her fault. And I'm so happy that she has come to that realization because someone should have told her that a long time ago and she was unfortunately failed. She was so failed. On top of that, during Elizabeth's ABC interview, which I will have linked down below, it's an amazing interview to listen to. The fact that she said that she wanted to come out and speak and tell her side of the story because she didn't want people to think that she's a whore that likes old men the literal words that came out of her mouth. She didn't want people to think that she was a whore that liked old men. It, it just made me ill inside hearing her have to say those words. Those words were coming in the mouth of a 17 year old telling her story about when she was abused at 15 years old. It's so ridiculously sad that in this day and age, a 17 year old has to say that. She has to defend herself like that. And that is why this case makes me so mad and upset that there are still people in this world that would say things like that about a child. In my opinion, whoever says that this 15 year old girl was a whore and a willing participant in what happened to her is just as disgusting and guilty as any pedophile. It's enabling behavior. And it's a horrifying in this day and age that that still happens. It seems that in present time, Elizabeth is doing a lot better, thankfully. She works at a coffee shop. She has a boyfriend. She has a new puppy. She's also working on her GED with plans to go to college to become a medical examiner. Elizabeth says that her dreams in life are to have a family and protect them and, and not let them be led down the road like she was and to make them have a better life. I'm a stronger person than I was and I'm not afraid. I'm so glad that the story has a positive ending, as positive as it can be. So after hearing this case, I really hope that you can understand why I am so upset and angry. And I really hope this case is a very good example of everything you see on the media and on TV isn't how it actually seems. Because again, what initially was shown and initially the storyline was, was that she was a willing participant that had like run away with him. Again, I really hope after all of this has now come out and the full story is out, I hope they feel really fucking bad. I would be so embarrassed to even show my face in public ever again. And I hope they are. So yeah, how do you all feel about this case? Let's have a chat about this down below. Again, I will not tolerate any victim blaming. If you enjoy me covering cases that have quote unquote happier endings, let me know down below and I will look into more cases like that. Not just cases that are like completely unsolved or like people don't get caught or people are dying. At least in this case, Elizabeth is, you know, able to live out her life. I'm so thankful of that. I'm so glad this case didn't go the way most cases do. Hit that subscribe button. And if you can give this video a thumbs up, it really does help me be able to continue to make content like this and helps me spread the word of cases like this. And hopefully it will help lead to better solutions for other cases. With that, I need to go take a breather because this case made me very upset, but I will see you in the next video. Bye.